Good morning, friends. We're here at St. Paul's Anglican Church on the Grand Parade in Halifax, Nova Scotia, here to celebrate the sixth Sunday in Pentecost. God, your word is a lantern to my feet and a light upon my path. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you always. We'll say together as we have the words, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. And let us pray. Almighty God, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. May we find peace in your service, and in the world to come, see you face to face. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Abu Semi will read the first song.
The first lesson is written in Genesis chapter 25, beginning at the 19th verse. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter, daughter of Bechtua, the Aramean of Pandan Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. One shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle. So they named him Esau. Afterwards, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking as two, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, First, sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentils too. And he ate and drank and rose and went his way. First, Esau despised his birthright. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. And we'll bring us the song. <clears throat> Your word is a lantern to my feet and a light upon my path. I have sworn and am determined to keep your righteous judgments. I am deeply troubled. Preserve my life, O oh Lord, according to your word. Accept, O oh Lord, the willing tribute of my lips, and teach me your judgments. My life is always in my hand, yet I do not forget your law. The wicked have set a trap for me, but I have not strayed from your commandments. Your decrees are my inheritance forever. Truly, they are the joy of my heart. I have applied my heart to fulfill your statutes forever and to the end. Now 
The epistle is written in Romans chapter 8, beginning at the first verse. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin, he condemns sin in the flesh, so that is the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord. Lord be with you. With you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. That same day Jesus went out of a house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell upon the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil, and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet, such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. The Gospel of Christ. Praise, 
Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Church, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. As I was listening to our epistle reading, I noticed the repeated use of the word flesh. And actually, it got me thinking about art. For the past few hundred years, especially uh, in the 16th and 17th centuries, but still, European artists have had a fascination with butchers' shops. Especially a few hundred years ago, uh, to paint a butcher's shop was a way of putting raw flesh on display in a way that was both uh, disconcerting and uh, intriguing. They would paint the meat in vivid reds and uh, bands of fat in brilliant whites. And it was all there, sausages and chops and ribs and whole animal heads. Very fleshy. You can almost smell the sour but intoxicating scent of a meat stall in a market. It's a bit overwhelming, in fact. You, your mouth begins to water, but there's too much there to taste it all and it sort of makes you sick, but it sort of draws you in. It's tempting you to believe in a world that is all about consumption. But these images are fascinating because they also do something else sometimes. In my favorite example, there's a little window in the butcher's shop, and you can look through it and far in the background, there's a biblical scene. It's the flight from Egypt. The Holy Family is fleeing into Egypt. But we, the viewer, on this side of the butcher's shop, we're still ogling all the steaks, but the Holy Family is hightailing it out of there. Why? Why? Well, the answer is also in our epistle, because the fleshly mind is death. If you live in the butcher's shop, you die in the butcher's shop. And of course, we know this. We know that a life centered around consumption and the immediate gratification of all of our impulses, it destroys, destroys our planet, destroys the most vulnerable among us whose lives and labor we consume, and most of all, it destroys our capacity to love those around us and the world that God gave to us. We know that. But we also know that there's other ways of living. We know that it's possible to turn our minds to joy and peace and love. We know that there is delight in thought and in poetry and in art and craft and sport. And above all, we know that we can savor our relationships with one another and with God. These two attitudes our epistle reading calls the fleshly mind and the spiritual mind. The fleshly mind is the attitude of the butcher's shop, the intoxication with consumables. The spiritual mind is the attitude that looks through the window of the butcher shop to Jesus, to the places where real life can be found. 
But as I said, the problem is not that we don't know the difference between the fleshly mind and the spiritual mind. We know it. The trouble for us is that we don't live in the spiritual mind that we know is better for us and for those around us. It's not a problem that we don't know, it's that we don't do. And in fact, it's not just that we don't do, it's that we sometimes are in the spiritual mind and sometimes in the fleshly mind. We waffle, we flop, and we worry. Don't we? Does one invalidate the other? Can we really claim to be spiritual if we are ever fleshly? If this is our position, then we are precisely where St. Paul was when he wrote the letter to the Romans, and we are precisely where the church in Rome was, too. In Romans chapter 7, in the passage immediately preceding what we heard, Paul speaks very honestly about his inner conflict. He says that in his mind, he wants to follow the law, he wants to do what he knows to be good, but it just happens that his body ends up doing something else. It's as if there are two laws working in his body at the same time. And he announces the solution. Jesus will deliver him from the habits of sin which bring death and which are warring against his mind in his body. And he announces the solution, but in today's reading he develops that solution not by talking about himself, but by talking about us. And he starts right away with good news. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. How much? None. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And why? He lays it out briefly because he's referring to what he's already written in the letter, but he says that God, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, condemned sin in the flesh. That is, the Word of God, the second person of the Trinity, came among us, took our flesh, the very same flesh that we have, but didn't have the fleshly mind, and took on himself the condemnation that the fleshly mind deserved. There's no condemnation left. Jesus has presented himself to the Father as the representative of all human flesh. There's nothing left for us to deal with by ourselves. There's no condemnation left for us. But there is a new identity. In the end, we have to identify which mindset, the fleshly mind or the spiritual mind, characterizes us most deeply. But St. Paul has already answered that question for us in advance. Remember, that's the question we were worried about. And St. Paul answers it this way. 
you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit. After Jesus' death, it is impossible that the fleshly mind and condemnation have the final say in the life of anyone who has faith in Christ and has been baptized. It is impossible. Church, you are free from sin. You are free from the fleshly mind. It has been nailed to the cross. There is no condemnation left for any remnant of the fleshly mind that still persists by habit in your body. We are Christ's. We are Christ's. When we fail, when we disappoint ourselves, when we feel weak and ashamed, when the dragon of sin rears its head and growls, what do you tell yourself? Do you tell yourself, this is the proof that I'm really no good in the end, God can't actually accept me, even if he wanted to? Do you tell yourself that? That is the fleshly mind. Or do you tell yourself, this sin is the sin that Jesus died to save me from, and it worked. I am his, and though the habits are, of sin are still ingrained in my mind and emotions, I am his, condemnation will not have the final word in my life. I am free to move on, to be confident in the love of God, to remind myself of the identity I have in Christ as a beloved child. Erring, but beloved. And can I remind myself that it is the work of the Spirit to lead me into all holiness in his time? There is no condemnation. Because Jesus has given us a new life in the Spirit. Anyone who shares his life shares that spirit. That's the message of our epistle reading. And so, in closing, I want us to meditate on the final words of our reading. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in you. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, 
true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Let us pray with Anne for God's world and all God's people. I bid the prayers of the church. I ask prayers for those who live in poverty in this city, facing a summer of loneliness and isolation with the places they depend on for friendship and encouragement close to them. I ask prayers for our place, the fish, coffee house as we ready it to receive our friends once again. I ask prayers for those becoming accepting of isolation and loneliness. May God raise up for each one a friend to talk to about things that matter. I ask prayers for government leaders, for all those who make decisions that affect the lives of others for those who must grieve in isolation and not in community, give your comfort, Lord. For the generosity needed from those who have more resources, give your courage, Lord. For the times when we are out of creative ideas for how to get through this with our kids, send your inspiration, Lord when we need to turn off the fear-mongering and mean-spirited commentary and ignore the clickbait, give your strength, Lord. Today and in all the days ahead, be with us, Lord. God, unbound by time, help us to know that you are already present in any future we will face. And let us pray together the litany. Let us pray, O Lord, responding, hear our prayer. O Lord, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Let us pray with the psalmist for the peace of the world, that the Lord would turn his face towards us and turn our faces toward those who need our help. Take a moment and remember those whom God has placed in our hearts this morning. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray for this country and especially for our mayor, premier, prime minister, and all who work beside them and we who support them. Let them have eyes to see and ears to hear, the people they serve. O oh Lord, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Let us pray for children and youth, for singles and couples and parents, for the retired and the elderly. May the Lord, through us, grant them consolation in their sorrows and joy in their daily rounds. O oh Lord, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Let us pray for those who sit at our gate, for the ill, the discouraged, and the depressed. May the Lord deliver them 
and through us, keep them in God's love. Let not the lonely be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray for all who are condemned to exile, prison, harsh treatment, or hard labor, for speaking the truth and for living justly. May the Lord, through us, support them and keep them steadfast. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray for restless hearts, that the Holy Spirit may open our ears and prick our conscience for the forgiveness of our sins and for grace to amend our lives and to further the reign of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. Accept, O oh Lord, our thanks and praise for all you have done for us. We thank you for the birth of Anne-Marie Rose, daughter of Sinov Arnay and Bill Healy. We thank you for the splendor of the whole creation, for the beauty of this world, for the wonder of life, and for the mystery of love. But above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord, Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. Grant us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives. O oh Lord, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. And now, as our Savior Christ taught his first disciples, we also pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen.
Why not drop in to Zoom coffee hour, meet some of your friends, some of us here, 11 o'clock. If you don't have the link, find us online, St. Paul's Halifax, send us an email and we'll be happy to invite you in. And now, the peace of Christ be with you always. The peace of Christ be with you always.